Agini Kurt, eh, Erin Gaydal Shiv, this mean Lamaroga will fear Kinoha Saram, Velia, Vakas Shiv, eh, Ek Kilura, Gokhid Vlian, Neda Irocht, Frederick Ossan Hambanaha, Bunahor, come and nave inchin the fool. Eh, you know, Rire, so called Kilura Gay, Agas Savis mean Lam of Weekes a Gole, Jeff Maher, eh, Ossacht and Quitta. A hokshadam tiak this lowered live. I'm very pleased to be here today to celebrate the bicentenary of the birth of Blessed Frederick Osnam, founder of the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. And as I have just said in our own language, I would like to thank Jeff Maha for his very kind invitation to join you today. And all of you, I want to say, Karamila Magia Sacht and Firkin Fulcher Darishirum. Thank you all for that very warm welcome. I'm very happy to pay tribute to a very powerful spiritual figure who through an engaged ethics and a vision of religious belief realized it was based on the dignity of one's fellow being. And to be asked to pay part of the tribute to him, the legacy, of a magnificent organization that not only assists but stands in solidarity with the poor and insecure. First of all, Frederick Osnam himself, uh, he died very young, as we would see now at 40 years of age. It, it is difficult, impossible maybe, to summarize the complex, multifaceted and fascinating personality that was Blessed Frederick Osnam. I think I thought when I was preparing these words uh, to try uh, and think of how you could see it through the lens of today. He was a prolific scholar, a deeply intellectual man, a passionate and devout Catholic who believed in the mutually generative nature of faith and science and of Christianity and of progress. Uh, that in itself is very, very important as a reflection because he was somebody who thought, as it were, you could take the greatest instincts of the heart and the spirit and find no contradiction between them and science, that there was nothing you couldn't understand either, and that understanding which came from the head was influenced by the empathy that came from the heart. And that in relation to spirituality, that it was a spirituality that was an engaged spirituality through the ethics of one's time. It was not for him to say that you could, as it were, aim for the kingdom of heaven that would come and at the same time avert your eyes or your gaze from the slum of life that was all around you and affecting your fellow human beings. So he is a powerful figure himself. He was a brilliant and widely acclaimed lecturer in law. And indeed, in his lectures in law, he regularly referred to the distance between the legal text and the impulse of justice, and regarded, if he regarded, economics as an instrument um, for a wider moral vision, he regarded law as an instrument for justice. He wrote in hi on history, he wrote on literature, and he was particularly interested in the poet Dante. He also, I think, was very interesting in another way, insofar as that he didn't have that arrogance that is sometimes associated with his times, and that is that really the world, if it could only be reduced to what was rational and what was calculated, could tidy itself up. It's rather like the most useless piece of information at times when someone says to somebody in great need, you must pull yourself together. Well, I think in the writings of Frederick Osnam, people, he rejected this. In the society, the Society de Bongtud, where he and like-minded individuals were discussing the social gospels, uh, the social teachings of the gospel. 
recently reading about ethics myself. Uh, I think he would have fitted very well with what I might call uh, the Neo-Augustinians. He left behind him a prodigious and enduring legacy. And what better legacy could there be than to be able to know and to want to know and to celebrate that over a million people in countries around the world are working at so many different levels to help people in need within their societies. In many ways, the aims and work of the, the Society of St. Vincent de Paul reflects the comprehensiveness and multi-layered complexity of its founder. Founded in France in 1833, as I have already mentioned, rooted in a strong desire for social justice and a ba basic but varying impulse to provide practical assistance to the poor and the needy. The words which give birth to the society are perhaps the most important ones, simple words, but most important ones uttered by Blessed Frederick Osnam when challenged at a meeting of the Society des Bonnes Etudes as to what the Catholic Church was actually doing to help the marginalised and excluded. He said, Yes, let us visit the poor. These words, short words, let us visit the poor, are very important. It isn't time, but I should say that I am preparing for later on this year for a major seminar on ethics. And that is why I'm reading in my free time, and I have some uh, at night, uh, on, uh, on the literature on ethics. But the words, let us visit the poor, the word visit itself is a very powerful one because it isn't defined only by what you bring or what you take. It is about making a visitation. It is about sitting down with another human being and not only recognizing their fundamental dignity as equal to your own, but of being in their company, of being able to be there because being there is enough at times and no words are necessary. I've been very struck often in speaking to some people I know who collect money at the sides of the street, lying on blankets and in paper, collecting in paper cups. And maybe some of the most challenging things I heard when they say that it was just enough to be spoken to with respect or to be listened to. So visiting is important, that words of Frederick Osnam. Yes, let us visit the poor. It's about recognition, it's about listening, it's about solidarity, and it is about recognizing about the finitude. We're all going to die sometime, but in the meantime, while we're living in this world over which we have some control, visitation is important. I think that philosophy that he built that stands behind the work of the St. Vincent de Paul might have began with philanthropy, and it, is it was aimed to address and challenge the root causes of poverty and social justice, but it now has moved on. I find, I might tell you, that early in the morning, one of the things that I found in preparing this paper as well, there's a very famous study from the 1980s that's reported in the American Journal of Social Psychology. And it's a story built around from a practical study, as people do so well in the United States, at a theology school in relation to the parable of the Good Samaritan. <coughs> they spread the word that there were people who were interested in recruiting people for careers, theology graduates, postgraduates, but the, the work was that you had to attend a lecture on the Good Samaritan and then write an essay. And they actually set up an experiment in which they told some people that they had three minutes, more people that the lecture was on in a half an hour's time, and more people that was in an hour. The people in an hour stopped with the injured person who was at the, the side of the road that was the, the experiment. But the ones who had only the three minutes, the, the 20 minutes, didn't spend as much time. And the ones who had three minutes going to the lecture on the Good Samaritan practically trampled the body on the ground. They also 
were further experiences in which they dressed the people differently. And the people who were dressed closest to the people themselves, the people stopped and conversed with, but the most tattered with, they gave the least amount of time. And then there was another one, of course, as well, in which they switched on the lights of a car and they put on the back of the window of one of the cars saying, it's time for the Black Panthers, but nobody turned off the lights in the car. And then they were always like, America, love it or leave it. So therefore what we bring on our visitations to people always carries certain assumptions about the deserving poor which we have to eliminate. And therefore it raises questions that it isn't a matter of just arriving and recognizing a poor person. It is really worth reflecting on why you are there and the St. Vincent de Paul workers do it all the time. Why you are there and what motivation has brought you there. So philanthropy is not a neutral, not a neutral point. It is not an exercise in the disposal of, uh, uh, of surplus through some form of guilt. And neither is, indeed, I think I was sorry to see an old principle of the Methodist faith distorted recently about saying, gain all you can, save all you can, and give away all you can. It wouldn't be very solid, either theology, in my view, or ethics. The organization that Frederick Ferguson founded evolved, and it, in many societies, uh, it, it, uh, it looked at how we, it looked at the human being as a full human being. But I do think it's useful for us all to reflect, uh, not only on our impulse to altruism, uh, but how it can be sustained. By visiting those in need, and understanding their backgrounds. I'm always moved as well by something that Amartya Sin said, to be able to participate in your society without shame. It might need a suit, it might need only a jumper, it might need only the capacity to be clean, it might need only to be able to, be able to participate in your own society without shame. No. I think societies should judge themselves on whether they meet that standard or not. But by visiting those in need and understanding their backgrounds, Osnan believed that the struggles of the marginalized were the struggles of society in general. And it was his conviction, returning to his spirituality, that by bearing witness and giving voice to the suffering and the lived experience of the poor and the excluded, the Society of St. Vincent de Paul could and should work for social change. And I am very honoured to be here as President of Ireland to recognise that. As a student activist, Frederick Osnam recognised the importance of not just engaging university students of a typically affluent background with the reality of poverty and injustice, but also ensuring that their intellectual formation was connected to experience and reflection on social reality in order that a sense of social justice should temper any impulse to build their actions and decisions around personal advance alone. His was a radical and forward-thinking vision, and one that has been developed and expanded over the years. And it was a great event when the society was first established in 1844. It is today it's the, one of our best-known uh, charities. It is recognised as the frontline element of its work, is familiar to the majority of our citizens. And for many, their engagement with the society, all of those citizens, sometimes they give, it involves making the giving of money that can be used to help the less fortunate in our society. Or, uh, and I like to say this business, not just the less fortunate, as if there's some judgment involved, those often who have been failed in our society, those to whose participation barriers have been placed in one place or another, and often between one generation and another. There are others who are helping the Vincent de Paul through volunteering the charity shops, and those who, desperate, who do support them, and they are an important part of raising funds for the society. I myself am very familiar 
with some of the later work of the society. The St Vincent de Paul is an approved housing body for the last 25 years and has provided over a thousand units of social housing across the country with the assistance of government funding and private donations. I opened one of these myself, I remember, maybe just when I was Mayor of Galway. Another one I visited, and then in Mill Street in Galway, I called it to see and used some of the facilities for community consultations. It is one of the largest homeless service providers in Europe. It provides emergency accommodation in 14 locations across Ireland, and then there are other services that maybe are less known, but which I'm very well aware of. The child care, education programmes, leisure facilities for all ages. And it has 11 holiday centres in Ireland to provide holiday breaks for those who otherwise could not afford it. I might say to you something else as well, quite casually as well. I had people who worked for me in Leinster House. And I remember one of my assistants in, in the final years of my time in Dolaren was somebody, and I see him filling in these little envelopes as regularly every week. And it was visiting the people that he had in the particular allocation that he had. And that impressed me more than so many other things. We learn to perform different things that are required of us, and how we speak in public, how we might, all the rest but to quietly go about the work of radically recognising the equality of the other person. That is a real exercise mm -hmm. in citizenship. And while many will have heard of the home visits, which the members of the society make to some of their clients every week, <coughs> they may not realise how these visits are part of the unique character of the society. By ensuring that those who work for the society build relationships with the people who are trying to assist. And that is important, listening, being present, initiating conversation. The members, like Frederick Osnum, are enabled to reach a true understanding of the difficulties people face and to develop an awareness of the larger issues that lie at the root of many of those difficulties. Sometimes someone has said this, Tom Murphy speaking to me lately, was talking about his play Famine. And Mary Mullen had just given an extract from it. And she said, and Gary said, and Tom said, there is so much suffering, and yet there are so many smart people in the world. Well, what has gone wrong? That is what I was speaking in Europe earlier this week. What has gone wrong with so many smart people? Maybe it is that they are not looking at the world. Maybe it is that the smart people are not so smart after all. Or maybe it is simply that there is something wrong with the tools that they have used in order to understand their world, including the tool of staying in contact with the vulnerability of the people. I will speak often during my presidency and out of a European Union only of affluence, one of the trading areas, but a European Union of vulnerabilities, which we share and through sharing rise to being genuinely members of a union. The Vincent de Paul does not see its role as the simple offering of assistance, although that is so important. But I have said that it has helped in breaking down barriers to those who are entering employment. I remember in the early days, the letters you would get about they're turning off the electric. Others in relation to fees and education, putting a safe and secure roof over heads. I think that it, all of this is about participation in your society as an equal without shame. Today in Ireland, 14% of our labour force are unemployed. Among young people, the figure is so much greater. And there are 700,000 people in poverty across the state. And isn't there something wrong with so many unfinished houses and houses built to poor standard while we have 5,000 actually homeless people? And in addition, many families are struggling with high levels of debt and mortgage arrears. People who had been invited, put your foot on the property ladder. 
young people whose invitation to life was, you wouldn't want to delay before putting your foot on the property ladder. And the idea was then that you'd keep selling your house again and again and again and become incredibly wealthy. What a version of Irishness and one to which we should not return. These are serious obstacles, all of what I say. Then there are those who are working even in relation to m try and meet the nutritional needs of their families. I say this to criticise nobody, but to speak as President of Ireland, to issue an invitation, to celebrate the work of the St Vincent de Paul, but to begin to have a discussion on a few fundamentals. There is nothing so complex, fiscally, economically or socially, that we cannot understand and get a better outcome. We have to have that confidence and we have to take back from that narrow expertise the suggestion that we are illiterate ethically, economically, socially, culturally. We also then have to realise as well that our lives are short and we put the stamp of our generation and our humanity and our several generations in creating something entirely different rather than breathing light into a bag that has too many holes. I think that a core focus of the St Vincent de Paul has been in recent years, as you said, to lobby and advocate for the barriers to be recognised and dismantled, to create an island of, univer of, universe of solidarity, inclusion, achievement of universal provision, as much as we can to lift the, st the floor, and in doing so, they are talking about citizenship. Above all, what is important is I actually meet people. It is about respect. So we know in recent years that we Irish have failed quite frequently because we have been following uh, uh, at what I have just been described, a false model, the advancement of private interests, the idea that having become very wealthy yourself, almost casually, you could arrange for other people not to be in destitution. I think that the assumption that there is no obstacle in to the endless race, as I have said, in property prices, to the amount that anyone would want to own, or maybe I have got it all wrong. Maybe there is a version of the person that Frederick Osenham, I know he didn't seem to support it, the person who's insatiable in terms that maybe when you have owned half of London, you should really get going on New York before it's too late. As a nation, we have learned that a people's reliance on that kind of thinking, on unregulated markets, getting everything out of the way to make it possible, brought us, not only in Ireland, in Europe, in the world, a disastrous result. What we need is a social economy and a space of citizenship and truly public spaces where free goods like music and the band that is playing and all of the rewards of culture and all of the genius and all of the imagination of young people can be shared together. And because we share it together in public without putting an entrance fee in a way, it is all the better. I want to conclude by saying this. Again, in my previous life, when I was a public representative, I always made it my business coming up to the budget to go up to the College of Physicians in Kildare Street to hear Professor John Monaghan giving his pre-budget lecture. It was the one that we used to always find useful, those of my thinking. And also it was detailed and statistical. Because, you know, people sometimes think that those of us who are interested in ethics are somehow illiterate about the economy. Some of us have spent decades studying the economy, and neither are we illiterate about finances or taxation. And John Monaghan always had the best figures. Careful study. And he has said, thinking of all I have been saying now, this is from himself, we do not want to look back on this period as one when the seeds of future social inequities were sown, but one in which the values necessary for a socially just, fair and caring nation emerged. And Professor Monaghan is right. We do now need a new connection between economy, society and the person, one based on ethics. And that will require a debate about the relationship between us all. And as we work to rebuild our damaged economy, 
It is important that we speak about doing it in a way that creates a citizenship that is ethical, fair, and all-encompassing. Recognizing that participation in the public world, remind, remember what I've said, it takes clothes, it takes cleanliness, it needs confidence, and these are all the things that take place when people do what Frederick Osnam asked, let us visit the poor. And in getting the big changes that Professor Monahan has been speaking about, that requires intellectual work, because those who want to change society have to work harder, including intellectual work, than those who don't want it changed. And above all else, as Michael David reminded us, real change demands moral courage. So, mar fuckel sker concrete car lesion made, three slim liveries. Across the years, the Society of Vincent de Paul has lobbied, advocated for the society I've been talking about, expanding Frederick Osnum's radical and forward thinking vision. The society's expertise on the ground, and it has that, its careful and considered research program, of which I've given an example. Its policy briefings, which keeps its members up to date, will be of immeasurable assistance, not just in advocacy and policy and development, but in building the capacity that is necessary in the non-governmental sector. And what a jewel we have in Ireland then. 9,500 volunteers in 1,000 conferences across the country. Ni feather in avarice of Erenia. Ke comores atom with marfodal, for a communic agriot, a hias la hashlingato, e vatnis lene, non de in cordus fein, ocavin ac guinunt ne socish a agina, ocas I'm shunt cart a social thread here, a hiapus a hero arke. I want to conclude by thanking all those who give so freely of their time, skills, and experience to ensure the legacy of that great humanitarian and complex mind that were it blessed Frederick Osnan, whose legacy has continued for 200 years after his birth and 180 years after he uttered those famous words, Yes, let us visit the poor. Ganairele vegas gim gagra vegas banak dori agas eirur nirakti dasna blianta tole chiakt dun tau ki Thank you very much.